Hello and welcome to our latest presentation on acute liver failure management, the latest guidelines. The definition, acute liver failure is a rare clinical syndrome characterized by coagulopathy and encephalopathy. It is secondary to an acute hepatocellular necrosis in the absence of chronic liver disease. It is rapidly evolving over a course of days to weeks and usually culminates in a multi-organ dysfunction. Going to the details of the guidelines with the evidence, the evidence will be there in the description for you to see. These are the common causes of acute liver failure, which is viral hepatitis, mostly in the Asian countries and drug induced, mostly in the Western countries. And the other rare causes are autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's disease, Bartschieri syndrome, and pregnancy related things. So, the initial management is the most important thing. In the initial management, what we need to do first is fluid resuscitation, then airway protection. This is very, very important. If the sensorium is low to protect the brain, we need to intubate the patient and put him on ventilator. Correct the gross metabolic derangements. Go for a NAC infusion without delay, especially in a confirmed case or a suspected case of paracetamol overdose. It is better to go for elective intubation and initiate early neuroprotective measures. Prophylactic antibody is of use in with the onset of organ failure and encephalopathy. Avoid correcting coagulopathy unless there is a severe bleeding and early discussion with a specialized liver unit for transfer. Now coming to the therapy that we need to do after the initial fluid resuscitation and intubation. Coming first to the cardiovascular support. Again, the fluid resuscitation is the most important thing. Uh, the fluids which have been used are the crystalloids that is the buffered solution or the saline solution it is preferable to use the buffered solution albumin and other colloids have not yet been tested in acute liver failure so it is better to avoid them if you still require a vasopressor it is better to go for noradrenaline and supplement it with vasopressin or telepression as a continuous infusion if the shock still persists you can add supplementary corticosteroids which have been shown to reduce the dose of vasopressors and get early reversal of the shock but the addition of corticosteroid till now has never been documented as res resulting in improved mortality but then it is better to add a steroid if you are requiring vasopressors in acute liver failure Next is respiratory support. Endotracheal intubation is mandatory if the patient has high grade encephalopathy. Standard related measures aiming to reduce the ventilator associated pneumonia should be utilized, mostly the head end elevation and the use of subglottic shuxening. Moderation of the PEEP and relative normocapnia is very, very important. Try to keep the PEEP as minimum as possible and Keep the PCO2 between 30 to 35 to reduce secondary brain insults. It is safe to go for percutaneous tracheostomy despite the presence of coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. Coming to the most important that is the neurological management. Sedation should be given long term for neuroprotection. Do not avoid sedation because the patient is in liver failure. Sedation will protect the brain. It is better to sedate the patient and keep the brain protected rather than keeping the patient off sedation. The incidence of intracranial hypertension has fallen markedly in the last two decades and is observed in only 20% of the cases. This is mainly due to early intubation and use of sedation in these patients. For routine monitoring, transcranial Doppler can be used for cerebral perfusion pressure estimations measuring the cerebral blood flow velocities. Optic nerve shift diameter and its serial monitoring can be used to measure the neurological status. Arterial ammonia is identified as an independent risk factor and a threshold of more than 100 is associated with brain edema and a 
level of more than 200 associated with intracranial hypertension. So it is better to always measure the level of ammonia and go for ammonia reduction. So what are the methods which are employed for an ammonia reduction? CRRT is a preferred method to reduce ammonia. Ammonia clearance with CRRT correlates with UF rate and high volume filtration of 60 to 9 mils per kg per hour exchange rate. The use of L-ornithine and L-aspartate has never been found to be of benefit in RCTs in acute liver failure and no other agent has been of any proven benefit for ammonia reduction. So it is better if you are having CRRT facilities to go for dialysis in these patients. Now coming to the coagulopathy management. Functional testings have revealed minimal disturbance and even a prothrombotic state in acute liver failure. Bleeding is extremely rare and clinically insignificant. Thrombocytopenia and not elevated INR is a major risk factor for bleeding. Coagulopathy usually requires correction only in the event of active bleeding or if you are planning a major invasive procedure. There is no evidence of benefit from giving prophylactic blood products in treating the elevated INRs. So do not treat the elevated INRs and avoid transfusion because transfusions have very high risks of infection and we do not want infections and other reactions in these particular cases. Acute kidney injury, it is seen in more than 50% of the patients with acute liver failure and it is likely of multifactorial origin resulting from both the consequences of renal tissue hypoperfusion and acute tubular necrosis and from functional disturbances. A continuous dialysis is preferred over intermittent dialysis because it protects the brain. The most important complication that is infection. These patients have a very high risk of developing infection Low threshold for prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics and antifungals should be used in the patients who have established encephalopathy and organ failure or those who have been planned for transplant. Nutrition, hypoglycemia is a common feature. Intravenous dextrose should be used to, until the glucose hemostasis is achieved. Supplement lipids, vitamins, trace elements and adequate proteins and amino acids as it is a highly catabolic state and resuming un early enteral feeding is always advised. Now coming to Nobles therapies, therapeutic plasma exchange, though it is not considered a conventional extracorporeal liver support, high volume therapeutic plasma exchange now has a grade one recommendation in non-transplantable patients fulfilling poor prognostic criteria of all causes. So in patients who cannot be transplanted, it is better to go for a therapeutic plasma exchange. The only RCT on the high volume therapeutic plasma exchange showed improved hemodynamics and biochemical parameters with increased transplant flea survival. Even low volume therapeutic plasma exchange showed comparable results with lower resource use. In this they used 3 liters of FFP per session extending over 2 hours with a reduced risk of transfusion related acute lung injury. Extracorporeal liver support, a variety of modalities are available like detoxification therapy with single pass albumin dialysis, molecular adsorbent recirculation system, the MARS or the Protheus which uses albumin and or plasma as a transporter to remove the plasma bound toxins and lastly cytosorb has been explored but none of these have been shown to be of mortality benefit in liver dysfunction. Now coming to prognostication and liver transplant. Fewer than 10% of liver transplant in Europe occur because of acute liver failure. In causes where the liver injury is very rapid like we see in paracetamol, the regenerative capacity is still retained by the liver even if with very severe initial brain damage. So with multi-organ support, effective regeneration may occur and patients survive with medical management alone. In other causes of non-paracetamol, minimal capacity of hepatic regeneration, liver transplant may be life-saving. Now coming to the prognostic criteria in identifying patients with liver transplant candidacy. Early identification of these candidates is very important 
so that the benefit of liver transplant can be given. The prognostic criteria that is commonly used are the King's College, Clichy, and the Japanese criteria. And nowadays, dynamic web-based algorithms have also been explored as a method of identifying these patients. Recently, UK has shifted from the King's College to the United Kingdom revised criteria. This is because of the improved medical management and improvement of the patients, especially with paracetamol toxicity. So to summarize, the management remains first airway, go for early intubation, airway protection, head and elevation. In the breathing, give lung protective ventilation and neuroprotective ventilation. In the circulation, give adequate fluids and start vasopressors. If you are going to high doses of noradrenaline, then you can add steroids. In the neuroprotection, again, intubation is better. Monitoring through ultrasound like optic nerve sheet diameter and transcranial Doppler. If you are measuring a level of ammonia more than 100, it is better to go for early CRRT. In fluid management, try to reduce the ammonia level less than 100. Go for continuous dialysis and keep sodium levels slightly high, around 145 to 155. In the GI tract, give IV dextrose, early enteral feeding and supplement with trace elements, proteins, amino acids and lipids. The most important thing is coagulopathy. Do not treat INR. Do not give prophylactic transfusions. Give transfusions only if the patient is bleeding. Last but not the least, infection prevention. Go for broad spectrum antibiotics and antifungals once you see features of multi-organ failure. Thank you for your patience and check our website for further information.